All right. Do you remember um, <clears throat> last week uh, I shared that when studying um, a letter, and as I studied first, we were studying First Peter, things really flow together. So it's really hard to just pick out a scripture and a command that Peter gives us all without knowing what he said before. And last week we kind of looked at when he said, therefore, was kind of a prelude for us to go back and look. And this week he says, so. So again, we need to go back and make sure we understand what he's saying. And we're going to be getting First, uh, first Peter chapter 2. But again, I think we need to do a quick, small recap. And it's not in as extensive as I did last week. But just beginning at verse 23, I think it's super important for us to know what he just said. And it was in verse 23, chapter 1. First Peter, he says, For you have been born again, but not to a life that will quickly end, for you, or sorry, quickly end, your new life will last forever, because it comes from the eternal living word of God, and that is the good news that was preached to you. This means that as believers in Jesus, we are reborn into a new creation. By accepting Jesus and his gift of salvation, on our lives, and being reborn by the Spirit and not by flesh, the world has lost its power and its grip and control over our lives. This past week, um, we were doing a, I was doing a homeschool lesson of, with my kids, a Bible study, and it happened to be on the bread of life. And so I had explained to, my, explained to my children what that meant when Jesus said, I am the bread of life, and when he simply meant that once you have a bite of me, when you take a, a, a bite out of me and, and experience my salvation, the hungers and thirsts of this world do not compare to what I can fill, the voids I can fill in your life. Come taste me, and you'll no longer hunger after the things of this world. You will only hunger for me, and I will fill every desire of your heart. And that's exactly what happens for us, for those of us that have accepted Jesus into our heart and have experienced his salvation and are reborn by the spirit that he quenches all of our hungers and our thirst. We no longer crave the things of this world. We're supposed to crave more and more of Jesus in our lives. This passage also informs us as readers that there is a, a new life that we're experiencing and it's not a fleeting one. It's not one that just is here today and gone tomorrow. It's a life that's eternal, a life that is, is never ending and death is no longer our enemy. It's no longer something that we should fear, but something that is, it's a simply a doorway into a new beginning of our next life. So it's not something as believers that we should be fearful of our lives. So, oh, I could die from this, or it might, that might end me. No, it, it, that's the welcoming. Death as a believer is a welcome embrace, because it means we get to step into the real journey, the real forever life that we have been promised in Christ. And in that also, we don't have to worry about the craziness of this life. The things that weigh us down, that, that hurt our heart, the things that we worry about and are so frustrated about in this life, those things don't have to affect us because of the promises that we have in Jesus. And because of the promises we have in Christ and the eternal security of that if we accept Jesus that we will go to heaven that we no longer have to worry about those things because really, what do they matter? What do those things really matter? Because they don't. Because this life is just for a second and then eternity is forever. Because we have this hope and we are freed from this control of the sinful world, we then can freely make the required changes in our life that Christ desires for us so that we can reflect Jesus. So this is what Peter is getting at, is that because we are saved, that we are reborn, that we've been given salvation, and that we have an eternal home with God in glory, we now can take that and not worry about all the things of this world, because we have that, and that's all we need in life, truly, we can then make the needed changes in our life so that we can be exactly who Jesus needs us to be to this world. So that moves into what Peter's going to talk about here in verse, uh, in chapter 2. And we're going to look at verses 1 through 3. Again, and this is, it's got a lot of similarities to what we just talked about in, uh, last week as far as holiness. And so we're going to go through this because I think it's 
super important. As I was studying, I thought, you know, this needs to be said as well. So, verses 1 through 3. So get rid of all evil behavior. Be done with all deceit, hypocrisy, jealousy, and unkind speech. Like a newborn baby's, you must crave pure spiritual milk so that you will grow into the full experience of salvation. Cry out for this nourishment now that you have had a taste of the Lord's kindness. Because of what we have received from Christ and have been promised by God, we should then be rid of anything that is not of God. We are to be rid of anything that is uh, not a reflection of who God is. And if it's evil, it's not of God. Okay? And so as I was thinking about this, I was again reminded of what I said last week when I talked about um, how God tells Ezekiel that he is, he is jealous, or sorry, that he guards his reputation. Okay? God tells the people through Ezekiel that I guard my reputation. It's because God wants his children, the children of God, to be a great reflection of who he is to the rest of his world, to the rest of the world. And so that's our job. He guards his reputation. It's our job as children of God, those that have accepted Jesus, to then be a reflection of who God truly is. And so when Peter says all this stuff, he's telling us to get rid of all this stuff so that we can be the actual reflection of who God is, not some muddied, oh yeah, I guess I can kind of see God through that person a little bit, but no, he wants us to be a clear, honest reflection of who God is as God reveals himself to people through his children. Pretty understandable, right? It's impossible through Christ, though, to be reborn by the Spirit and stay the same way than we were when we first received Jesus. Okay, it's impossible to truly be born of the Spirit and experience the grace of Jesus. It's impossible then to live the way you once lived. Okay, because there's a change. There's a, there's a rebirth, there's a change. And that's what Peter's trying to get to us at, is that that has to be gone. Peter urges these Gentile believers to be done with the evil, motivated things that they once lived by, and to set their lives apart by the things that can bring nourishment to our lives. Because with sin in our lives, that brings death and darkness. Sin brings death. It eventually, no matter what, the more sin is in your life, the, the quicker death comes to you. Okay, spiritual death. All right, where the opposite happens, when we nourish ourselves with Christ, life happens. An abundance of life happens. Okay, I'm not talking, that's not physical. I'm not talking about physical death. I'm not talking about physical life. I'm talking about a spiritual thing. And you guys know that. You've lived in that before in your life. Whenever you're living lost in sin, your life was slowly decaying and slowly dying. You could feel all hope going away in your life and, and, and sadness and all this different stuff. But when, now that Jesus is in your heart, Every day, the more you surrender him, the more you, you ask for him to live and rule your life, the more hope and joy and life comes. Even if this body is crumbling and breaking, you're still filled with a, a spiritual nourishment. This challenge by Peter, is, however, is not an easy task. It, it isn't something that just happens without a conscious effort by us All right, to do this, to remove such things. From our life. And if you look at other translations in Scripture, when it says to remove, it also says to strip off. Okay? Now, if you think of that word strip off, it's something that you have to do, right? If you're going to strip off like uh, something off of like a dresser, it's, it takes work. It's not just something, oh, I will you to come off. And it happens. No, you, you have to physically do that work. And, and then it's done, okay? Or if you have clothes that are muddy, and I think about my kids. Um, you know, when I have to, like, they've, they've destroyed clothes and, and you have to take it off. It, it's a process of you physically taking it off and removing it. And there are certain times in your life, and, and I can think of my kids in particular, and myself, where I'll have, like, some shirt and I'm, like, it's barely, you've worn it so much that it even barely is holding on by a thread. And for some reason, you like it so much, but then some re it, it just is totally ripped off and you, there's no way you can even wear it ever. And it's, and it's useless, or I think of my kids when they're, when they're babies and they have, well, what my, excuse me, but what my wife and I call like uh, eruptions up their diaper, and you're, you're not by home, and you're like, you're like, oh, 
I'm not driving another hour with that in the car. And so we get rid of it. We strip it off and we throw it in the trash can and we're like, it's not worth saving. Okay, it's going in the trash, never going to save this again. And that's the same thing that Peter's telling us right here when he says to strip off and get rid of. He's telling us to get rid of it. It's not just set it aside to be picked up again later on down the road. No, he says strip it off, get rid of it, throw it in the trash and never come back. Leave it miles and miles behind and forget where you put it. Let it go into the trash to be never picked up again. Surrender. We are called to remove all <coughs> evil and wicked behavior from our life. Not just some, uh, just not, not some pruning. You know, I'm going to leave a little bit of that there. And I'm gonna do, no, it says get rid of all wicked and evil behavior because it's not of God. It's not of God. And as I think about these four things that Peter specifically points out, I'm, I was kind of shocked when I thought about, when we, when we think of wicked and evil, I don't think we necessarily think of these four things. To be deceitful, I mean, no. I mean, being a hypocrite, okay. Uh, being jealous or unkind speech. Now, I think we all know that those are four things that are not good. All four of those things are not good. But I would say that for some of us, and I'm including myself in there, some of those four things are still probably a part of our life and have entered into our life. But Peter picks these four things for us to understand and to look at. And he talks about stripping off all evil and wickedness. And, and as I look at those four things, I don't think of wicked. I think of like murder as like wicked and something that's like real pure evil, like Hitler stuff. You know, that's pure evil. That, that's wicked. That's evil. Yeah, we should definitely be separated. But Peter... Specifically, I think, is taking something that maybe people don't think is that bad, but it really is. And why is it wicked and evil? Because it's not God's character. None of those four things are God's, a part of God's character. And because it's not a part of God's character, it is evil. If it's of the world, it's evil. If it's not of God, it's not good. And he's picking this out, even though it's not bad. I mean, I mean, all of us have struggled with these, I, probably at some point in our lives have struggled with some of this, and maybe even done this. I mean, I've, yeah, I've done all those things, for sure. Maybe not recently, but I've definitely done all those things. I've often been jealous, you know, of, you know, sometimes even as an adult, I get jealous that my wife is constantly dealing with the kids, and I'm like, way off, and like, not, she doesn't, she doesn't have any time for me, because she's always with the kids. So yeah, I get jealous. It's a little jealous. Unkind speech, there are characters that I see on television all the time. Not, I mean, when I say characters, I mean people. People in our government and stuff that I see, and when I, I'll see them and see how they talk and some things that they say. And sure, I have some unkind speech that I might say to myself or say to my wife. I'll admit it. I'll admit it. It's still prevalent in my life. There are things in, my pre in this that I do that are not of, of God and that we have to get rid of in our lives, so that we can accurately be a reflection of Jesus. And so Peter's telling us to get rid of them. Again, we're going to continue to hit this topic forever. And the reason why I want to hit this topic forever of, of this living a holiness life is because that's who we are called to be. That's who Jesus' church is called to be. I think that's what we've missed it. As we look at what's wrong with our world and our country, it's the church has not been holy and set apart. And that's as I think of God, who do you want us to be? Who do you want me to lead? How do you want me to lead? That is the overarching thing that he's called me, myself, to live in my own life. And I think that's what he's called us to be as the church. And so that's how we're going to live. And so as, as we look at what God desires from us, we should be vastly different from the world. Vastly, as, as light is from darkness. That's what we as the church should be from, from what the world is like. We, as a church here, the First Church of God, are going to be a holiness group of people. A group that sets up, not that we're better than anybody, and not that we're not flawed or make mistakes, but that we are making an effort, every possible effort, to be different from the world so that we can be a reflection of Jesus, a genuine reflection of who God is and how he can, can transform a once sinful life into something that is great. And that's the only way. If we live a holy life, then someone can see, wow, that's Zach Schaefer. I remember how he was in high school and junior high. 
and look at the difference in his life. Look what God can do. But that's only if I can make a complete change in my life. If I'm not just from a, a dark to gray, no, I'm supposed to go from dark to light, not somewhere in the middle. And then people can see that and say, man, look at that change, that drastic change that God has made. And that's what God has called us all to do. The wicked behaviors uh, of this sinful world are all faults uh, in, in, in the character of our lives. And did I lose my battery or something? Well, something's got to always go wrong. Well, this is, excuse me. Can you just give me the bottom thing? We'll be right back after this short commercial break. This is about right for today. Thank you, Kendra. Screen. We're good. We're on back on. Welcome back. Okay, now let me find myself. As a believer, how can we ever um, think of these four things that Peter points out? How can we ever be deceitful? If you think about who Jesus was, there was no part of Jesus that was deceitful. He was always pure. He was always honest with everybody. And all that he did was never selfish. It was always selfless. Everything that he said and he did was not for his own benefit, but for our, own, our benefit. Everything, the sacrifice, walking around, I mean, coming to earth, all the things that he did was not for our own benefit, but for the benefit of, of the people um, that, he was, that he was leading. Then you think of Christian uh, hypocrisy. It's probably the number one reason why people are not interested in the church because there's so many people that claim to be followers of Jesus, but really they're just wearing the churchgoer costume. Okay, they're just wearing a costume and saying that they go to church. All right, playing church, and it's caused this division. When people are looking for light, they're seeing people that are dressed in white but really are still in the darkness, or they're living that gray life that I talked about. Then you have that third example of that, e, or that uh, Peter um, puts a spotlight on, on jealousy. And as I talked about earlier by confessing my, sometimes my jealousy of my, my wife's time, but it, as, as all of us struggle with it, I mean, since we were children, we've been jealous of our sibling or a friend having, or, you know, of their success. And even as adults, we get jealous of other people's lives and the things that they have. And so this jealousy continues to run rampant into our lives. And even if you look at Mark chapter 10, you see the disciples who have been following Jesus for years, they're, what are they doing? What do they end up doing? They fight over who's, who's going to sit next to Jesus in the seat of honor. And they're jealous over each other of who Jesus likes more and who he favors more. And so this idea of jealousy really runs into our lives and it's built into us. As, as long as self remains active within someone's heart, within our hearts, there will be jealousy in that person's life. So as long as you allow yourself okay, to be in control of your life, their jealousy will enter into your life. The word used for that last thing when he says unkind speech, or in, in some Bible interpretations it may say gossiping, all right, but it can be translated into evil speaking, all right, and it's, it's a fruit of envy in one's heart, and in this, uh, and gossip is, I mean, there's even like a TV show called Gossip Girl, all right, it's like, a, well, it used to be, but there's, it's become some more like a, an everyday thing, an every, everyday situation where gossiping is more acceptable and acceptable for people to do. And it, it's not good. It, it is the opposite of what Jesus wants because it's mostly always done when no one is looking, when that person can't defend themselves. And it's something that tears and brings a lack of love. It destroys love in a, love, in a relationship. Okay, If you're talking bad about somebody and it's not something that any of us uh, should be a part of. It, it actually produces heartbreak and is so destructive to love and Christian unity. These are the things that those who are reborn in Christ that Peter puts a spotlight on, on that must be stripped off in our lives. And it's not just these four behaviors, it's all qualities that are not of God. And if we continue to allow darkness to have a grip upon our lives, 
the effectiveness of our witness will suffer. Think about that. And, and the many people that God has placed around us in our lives. Okay, God puts all sorts of different people in our, in our uh, realm so that we can minister to them, so that we can be his light to those people. And if we don't live an authentic life, a life that is, is holy and a reflection of Jesus, then those people may miss out on experiencing Jesus because we were the ones that were supposed to be authentic and real to them. We might have been the person that God destined to share, our, share the good news or to be the example to those people. And if we're not living that life, they may miss out on it because we have failed at being called and living out the calling that God has placed in each one of us. How do we do this, though? How do we dedicate to this holy living that God has called us to live? That God wants us to live, that he desires us to live. First, it comes from a willful desire in each one of us to, be, uh, to willfully desire to live this out, to make that effort and to figure out what it is, the reason why we want to do this. Okay, So to find the motivation to live this out. And for me, it's look at what God has done for your life. I mean, just think each one of you personally. What has God done for you in your life? You can go through blessings or whatever, but for me, I just start at my salvation. Okay, what he did for me on the cross. He gave me life, and then he rescued me when I had no way to rescue myself. All right, and because of that, because of that amazing love that he portrayed through Jesus and through himself, that I desire then to set my life apart. I desire to purify myself in any way because he deserves it. Because of what he did, he deserves everything. He deserves my all, every ounce of me, he deserves. And if he wants me to live a holy life, then I'm going to give it to him out of the overflow and love and adoration that I have for what he did for me. And so then the next thing after you figure out why you're going to do it or the motivation, then you get to work. You get working on it, and it, it, it's like getting healthy or deciding you want to get healthy in your life or deciding that you want to finish a project. You, you find your motivation, and then you start working at it. You don't just find a motivation and sit down and be like, okay, well, that's what I want to do. Start happening. No, you, you get to work at making it happen, and that's what Jesus wants to do each of us to do. As believers, once you find that motivation, you need to strip off. If we want to live this holy life and set apart life for Jesus, we must find our motivation, what's going to push us through it, then we strip off all the evil behaviors in our life by the power of the Holy Spirit, and we replace it with stuff that helps and nourishes us so that we can become the person that God created us to be, which I think all of us desire to be what God wants us to be. I don't think any of us who accept Jesus want to just stay the same. We expect there to be changes in our life. We expect for him to make us and mold us into more of his image so that we can be effective for him. And so we have to first strip all these things off and then fill our lives with some nourishment. And Peter tells us what that nourishment is supposed to be. And it says uh, at the end of uh, verse 3, craving spiritual milk so we can grow into the full experience of salvation. Okay, so if I were to use this as an analogy of, uh, of like getting healthy. Okay, a year and a half ago I lost like 45 pounds because I wanted to get healthy. Okay, I was tired of the way I looked. I was tired of being tired. I, was, I wanted to be different. I wanted to be changed. Okay? So I found the motivation that I needed because I started paying for something, and I don't like losing money. So I started paying for something. I found the right motivation to get healthy, and I started to exercise. I started to eat well. And so if we were to use that analogy and motivation as far as me losing weight and getting healthy and us getting our lives ready and set apart and spiritually and whole, pure, this is what I would say. Find your motivation. Okay? For me, exercising, I wanted to be healthy, wanted to lose weight. For me to be the child of God that God wants me to be, my motivation is God has shown me such a great amount of love, and I want to serve him out of the thankfulness and gratefulness of my heart. So I want to serve him, and I want to be everything that he wants me to be. That's my motivation. Okay, To get healthy, I had to exercise. Had to exercise. I could no longer just sit around and not do anything. I had to exercise. Even if it was small, I had to exercise. To be everything God wants me to be, I found my motivation, and then what I need to do next? Strip off all the evil and wicked behavior of my life. Okay, It's like the exercise of living this life. I have to strip off everything that does not belong, start working at it and stripping it off and taking it off daily 
Okay? Then the next thing is, in order I can't just exercise and have a motivation to be healthy, I have to eat healthy. Okay? I have to eat the right things. I can't continue to eat ding-dongs and, and Twinkies. I have to eat the things that are going to make me healthy. All right? And so you eat right. If you want to be the child of God, you find the motivation, you strip off all evil behavior, and then you fill your life with nourishment that is going to get you healthy. Okay? And Peter tells us it's the Word of God. It's spending time with God. All right? And reading the Word of God. That's the nourishment that we must have. And remember, we have to, Peter tells us that we need to yearn, our hearts need to yearn for pure milk. To pure milk, which is the Word of God, it's Jesus. We need to long for Jesus, to not only be in the Word, to be with the Word. As John tells us, in, that the Word is Jesus. Okay? And so it's not just reading the Bible, but it's spending time with the Word. Okay? It's spending as much time as we want and yearning for it. And if, if we're to live in this climate of not uh, holiness, we need to fill our life with everything, uh, all the ammo, all the nourishment that we can to prepare our lives for whatever is ahead of us. Christians must set our hearts on the word. Christians must desire with their whole heart to nourish and spend time with God. Believers are responsible to submit themselves to the word living according to the Word's teachings and producing, which will produce a radical change in our life. The more you spend in the Word, the less you want to be a part of the world. Okay, I want to make sure you understand that. The more time you spend with God in the Word and getting to know Him and spending time with Him, the less you want to go out and do the things of this world. Okay, so in order to truly, and it's kind of in that exercise thing, by me eating healthy, guys, I hate salad, Hate salad, all right? It's not something that I desire. But me eating straight-up vegetables and lettuce, by, by making that commitment, I was going to then exercise, okay? Because I wasn't just going to eat that nastiness. I wanted to be done as fast as I could with this. I wanted, I wanted to get to my destination, all right? And so I would eat this, this food, and I'd exercise, because if I'm going to do this, I might as well do this, okay? So if we fill our life with the Word of God... We're spending time nourishing ourselves, then we're going to strip off all the things that don't belong. Okay, because we're not going to just do one without the other, because this one is preparing us to do this one. All right, God, but God is going to prepare us. When we're reading God's word, it's going to make us feel like, oh, I don't want any of that anymore. I don't want this evil, wicked behavior. I don't want to be a part of the world anymore. I want to strip it all off. All right, and so it's, it's a give and take. Then it goes. On in verse 3, says, Now that you have tasted the Lord's kindness. This is a callback that Peter has from uh, Psalm 34, 8, when he says, Taste and see what the Lord, taste and see that the Lord is good. If you've experienced the saving power of Jesus in your life, and you know you've tasted, as I said, the bread of life, if you've tasted Jesus, the bread of life, and know that is good, you're going to want to live for that. We're going to live and continue to partake in that. And the more we dive into God's word, the more that we get into the word, the more he keeps filling us. It's like, it's like a buffet that we, that we never want to get away from. It's like a buffet that you never get full off of. You continue to want more and more and more, and he continues to nourish you and nourish you. And it's our responsibility as believers to continue to go to that word, to continue to go to the word and fill our lives just as a baby craves uh, pure milk, as what Peter's talking about, a baby uh, craves pure milk, and it nourishes that baby, we must crave the word so it can nourish us so we can grow. Without being with Jesus, spending time with Jesus, being in his word, we cannot grow as believers. If you are just coming to church on Sunday, and I'm the only feeding that you have, you're going to be a weak, sick believer. Okay? You will be weak and sick. And when the world comes at you, you're not going to have nourishment to be able to defend yourself to the world. And that evil behavior is just going to start packing itself on you. But if you feed yourself, if you feed yourself and you continually are getting fed and nourished by, by God's word and you're spending time, not just reading the word, but like setting time apart with Jesus, praying with Jesus, having a prayer, spending time in prayer, listening to him, having a relationship with your Heavenly Father, then you're going to be filled with the nourishment that you need 
in order to live this life, this journey, this, this adventure that we're called on to live a holy life. You're going to be able to stand firm in this holy living that he's called us to live so that we can be the light to this world that I think that this church is called to be in this community, that God wants us to be as followers of him, to be that light. Doing these things, living this holiness life, it's not, it, it shouldn't be like an obligation for us. It shouldn't be an obligation. It should be a pleasure. It should be the call of our heart, our desire to live a holy life, a set-apart life that's getting the evil off of our life and that we're filling our life uh, with Jesus. So like when you read God's word in the morning or wherever, whenever you read it, it shouldn't be like an obligation, like, oh, I got I to gotta read. Uh, you don't want Jesus to be mad at me. I don't want him to give me like, stomach flu or something because I'm not faithful. I don't want him to curse me. No, you, you read God's word because you long for it. You yearn for that filling, that nourishment. As maybe some of our stomachs are right now yearning for food. All right? You yearn for the food that Jesus provides for us through God's word and the growth he wants to have in each one of our lives. Kendra, you can go ahead and come. Thank you. I, wa- I saw this before and... and um, I think it really works well with what I want to say here, but I've read that if a fish, if you put a shark in like a, a, like a small aquarium, like a house aquarium, like they're never going to outgrow that. You're not going to put a shark in an aquarium and it's going to turn into like this eight-foot shark inside this aquarium. They're, they're stunted by their environment. Okay, but a shark that might only grow eight inches in an aquarium, if you put that same shark in the ocean, it can grow over eight feet long. And I wanted to tell you guys this, that the limitations that you have for your spiritual growth is your limitations. You have created those limitations. God desires you to become whatever he wants you to be. And I don't know what that for each one of us is, but it, it, it's the spiritual giants that you see from God's word, that, is, that can be us. That can be us. And God, I think God desires each of us to have those same relationships that he had with the, these pil- great pillars of our faith, or maybe even the early church people. He, I think he desires that for each one of us. But I think all of us have put our lives inside that small aquarium, and we think we can only get to that eight inches. And we've put limitations on our life, and God's saying, no, I want you to plant yourself in the ocean and let me grow you. Surrender to my plan for your life. Pour your life. Uh, pour, pour, get rid of all evil. Get rid of everything. Seek my nourishment and let me grow you into who I want you to be. But it's, it's your decision. It's each of our own personal decisions to be like, I want to surrender everything over to the Lord. I want him to grow me into something that I've never thought possible in my life. I want to surrender everything for the leading of God in my life. And he will grow you. So I'm asking you, church, and for myself included, Get out, of the, get out of the aquarium. Jump out of the aquarium and get in the ocean. Okay, Find your way there so that God can grow you into something that you never thought was imaginable. No matter your age, no matter your background, no matter if you're a new Christian or if you're one that's been a Christian for a long time. Get out and let's, let God do something amazing and grow you in ways you never thought possible. So that there's a purpose to it, not just so you are some wise person of faith, no, so that you can be a clear, authentic example of who God is to this world, who lives out his purpose, being the light, being his hands and his feet, and we can make an impact to the one who deserves to get an impact. Would you please stand?